Welcome everyone to Jung 101, Jung's Copernican Revolution. My name is Dr. James Newell and I want to thank you all for registering for this free introductory class on the basic outlines of Jungian psychology. Now this course, Jung 101, is really the flagship course for our whole series of courses because without this basic outline, uh, for those of you who have no familiarity whatsoever with um, Jungian psychology, you really need to have a grasp of the terminology because although it's really not very complicated, uh, that is to say it's not hard to learn these concepts, there are many of them. So you could say that it's complex and we want to take each element one at a time, put it, kind of tease it apart and then put it back together and by the time you finish this course, you'll be able to move on to the ideas of practical application and understanding just how Jung can be uh, so helpful in individual growth and uh, cultural transformation. And I, I really think it's so vitally important in our times today. I'm kind of an activist on this topic, which is why I uh, have become the director of the Depth Psychology Alliance and I'm now the director of the Depth Psychology Academy online because I just want to empower people to have access to this information and as I say it's not hard but it's complex and so I hope to break it down in ways that we can all understand it and uh, work with it. So what are we going to do in this first session? Uh, in general we will look at what Jungian psychology is and why as I say I feel it's so valuable to contemporary culture and yet at the same time it's widely overlooked by contemporary culture. Specifically, we're going to look at the basics of Jungian theory and discover some of the ways in which Jungian psychology can be of enormous practical value, as I've said, for individual personal growth and for collective cultural transformation. We'll briefly look at some of the key events and developments in the life of C.G. Jung, just to give us some context and some background on how he came up with this theory and really what sort of cultural milieu he emerged out of. Then we'll finally uh, run through uh, a brief overview of some of the different components of the eight modules of the actual Jung 101 course itself. This is the introductory module, but then there'll be module one, two, three, on up to eight, which will, as I say, piece by piece, move us through the different ideas. So why should anyone take Jung 101? Why even have a class on Jung 101. There's some people, when you ask them, they'll say, well, Jung is passé. He's uh, been, some people even say he's been proven to be wrong, yada, yada. Uh, obviously, I disagree with this uh, heartily. My own motivation, as I said, uh, for initiating this series of courses was my recognition of the need for a series of courses like this. It's my absolute conviction that Jung's work has enormous value both for individuals and for the culture. Secondly, the fact that most universities, major universities in general, do not teach courses on Jung or Jungian psychology alone, uh, Jungian psychology at all. Uh, my own training took place in divinity school. In divinity schools, some divinity schools, they will teach Jungian psychology because I think of it being as esoteric and uh, mystical. And certainly Jung involved himself in those kinds of studies, but he, he, he emphasized over and over that he was attempting, and I feel that he was very successful, but attempting to conduct a scientific study. Yet in the sciences, science departments, you'll find very little interest in Jung, generally speaking. And my third reason is, uh, although there is much interest in the work of Carl Jung, has been for many years, there's a big renaissance in the 1990s, uh, there's also a lot of misunderstanding and a lot of misinformation out there about Jung and his work. This makes it very difficult uh, for those trying to understand Jung's work. And it also undermines the efforts uh, of people like myself to accurately communicate what Jung said. So, our intention with these courses is to make Jung's work both available and understandable to a wider audience, and I really hope that we'll be able to empower people to take this knowledge and use it in practical ways to do their own inner work, 
if you're a professional counselor, coach, uh, pastoral person, be able to use this information to work with the people that you work with. If you're already licensed, you can add this component to the work that you do. And to uh, help, when we just look at the culture today, there is scarcely, I can't think of, and, and we have lots of chaos, lots of problems, lots of uh, just mass violence and wars and political corruption, everything. Uh, a, a, a culture that's obsessed with celebrity and obsessed with materiality. There is not an area of those and many, many others that I could name that cannot be informed and a lot of light shed on them when we understand the workings of the psyche, psyche of the people individually, and and how mass psyche works. Jungian psychology gives us an enormous insight into these things and is enormously practically valuable, not just for an individual's inner work, but for understanding culture and for intervening positively in culture in ways that can improve life for everyone. That's my very, very strong conviction. So one might well ask, why do I feel that Jung's work is valuable and so vital to the world today? And why do I want to help people to understand it better? Well, uh, and I named this module, this introductory module, Jung's Copernican Revolution. Well, what does that mean? Well, in the year 1543, astronomer Nicholas Copernicus published his groundbreaking book entitled on the revolutions of the celestial spheres. It's a long title, but with that book he ushered in what has come to be called the Copernican Revolution. Prior to Copernicus, the Ptolemaic astronomical system asserted that the sun and everything else revolved around the earth, and that the earth was the center of the universe. This was called geocentrism. Copernicus, uh, in a radical move, challenged this view and asserted that the only proper explanation for the observable movement of the stars and the planets was to recognize that it was actually the Earth which revolved around the Sun, not the Sun that revolved around the Earth. Now this idea that the uh, Sun revolved around the Earth was called helio... Uh, sorry, <laughs> that the Earth revolved around the Sun was called heliocentrism, it means the sun being the center, helio, and uh, geocentrism means uh, the sun revolves around the earth. Almost a full 100 years after the publication of Copernicus's discovery, the great Galileo, towards the end of his life, was found guilty of heresy and spent the remainder of his life under house arrest for supporting this Copernican view of heliocentrism, the idea that the earth revolved around the sun. Now, there's much of interest in this story of Copernicus and Galileo, but I mention it here only to make two points. First, that as the intellectual historian Thomas Kuhn points out in his classic book, The Structure of Scientific Revolutions, he says that even after being presented with solid scientific evidence, it often takes mainstream thinkers a long time to adapt to a new paradigm. And... You may already have guessed that the second point I want to make is that Jung's work for us has ushered in just such a new paradigm. And this is why, because it's a new paradigm, it's taken people a long time to understand it. Many of his ideas have been seeping into culture, but broadly, and particularly among intellectuals, uh, he's very much resisted. Jung has ushered in a scientific revolution, perhaps even more important than that of Copernicus. It took more than a hundred years for the world to accept the Copernican Revolution, and it seems likely that it will take even longer for Jung's ideas to be completely understood and accepted. Now, what is this revolution? Well, the old way of thinking was that the ego, the individual personality, was the center of the psyche and was the guiding center of the human organism. Jung has shown that this is by no means true. The guiding center of the human organism for Jung is rather found deep in the unconscious psyche. This guiding center makes itself felt whenever the conscious mind violates the sovereignty of this unconscious psychic center. Jung called this center the archetype of the self. 
So what does this mean culturally? For the, say uh, I'm asking you to suspend disbelief for a moment. I think many of you must have already or you wouldn't be taking this course. So what does it mean culturally? Uh, let's let's uh, imagine for a minute that Jung is correct, that the ego is not the center of the organism. And uh, he's not the first to say that, but he's deepened it. And this idea of the self is certainly he's the first to uh, propose this. Well, culturally, it's been said that up to the period of the Enlightenment, human beings have progressed from instinct to reason, and that now, in the period we're in, the transition to come is to move from reason, rationality, to intuition. Now, this does not mean a rejection of rationality or a rejection of rational thought. Rather, it is a higher order of reason that Jung is proposing. Jung referred to this original cultural shift, the first shift, or this first transition that I'm calling uh, from uh, instinct to reason. Um, he called it uh, eros to logos, many different terms, uh, feminine to masculine, from the mythic to the rational. Uh, any of these descriptions is accurate to a certain extent. The point is that however we understand this movement, it was an important and necessary development. It's not something that we want to reject. We want to perfect it. We want to move from instinct to reason fully. This movement from instinct to reason has actually been the project of science. The project of modern science has been to perfect reason, and the highest goals of science has been have been to perfect human reason for the service of human life and community. This was Jung's goal as well. However, Jung recognized that so-called pure reason was understood to emanate from the conscious ego, from the center of, of the psychic universe. Psychic simply means of the psyche. doesn't mean uh, being clairvoyant or having special powers. Psychic simply means for Jung of the psyche. And this was... How Even today, you'll hear people talk, and they take only into consideration the conscious mind. This does not take into account the intrusions which invade consciousness from the unconscious. This being the case, in order to perfect reason, it's necessary for human beings to include the unconscious and all of its imperatives and all of its intrusions and all of our deliberations must include that aspect of human life or we're just going to be at a loss. Now, this happens culturally when there's a mass shooting. It happens culturally when there's all manner of uh, antisocial uh, explosions of, of bad behavior, whether it be war or whatever. But we can't, unless we're in a position of power, we, we don't have much influence on that, but we have absolute influence on our own lives when we take steps in accordance with uh, something that is resonant and congruent with the movement of the unconscious psyche without losing our ability to think and discern rationally. That's the key difference between Jung and what some people will say is a regression back to this old level of instinct. So for Jung, what this means is that not just thinking, but also sensation, feeling, and intuition must all be levels of perception that are available to the personality. Sensation, how we feel things, feeling, our emotions, intuition, and ability to grasp the deep unconscious while discerning properly with the thinking mind. For this to be possible, for, for the integration of all these four functions, what Jung called the four functions, thinking, sensation, feeling, and intuition, for this to be possible, we must learn to dialogue with listen to and take seriously not only the personal unconscious, the memories of our past deeds and our misdeeds, but also we must listen to and take seriously the structured energy forms of the structured deep unconscious. Jung called these structured energy patterns archetypes of the collective unconscious. Now, simply by mentioning archetypes of the collective unconscious, we've already entered into deep waters. While some of you may be quite familiar with Jungian terms and Jungian jargon, others may not. In order to understand Jung's theory properly, though, we will need to learn his vocabulary and his understanding of unconscious processes. Now, what I've tried to give you so far is just a, a broad, uh, as I say, cultural uh, 
and historical view of the development, you could say even the evolution of consciousness. Uh, but in order to get into that more deeply and understand it more thoroughly in a way that's not confusing and overwhelming, we're going to take this piecemeal little bit by little bit. So what I want to do now is to guide us through a brief outline of Jung's theory. Of course, this whole course is going to be, as I say, taking it piecemeal. We're going to go through it a little bit quickly now because I just want to encapsulate it in this uh, brief class. And then throughout the, the next eight modules, we'll tease it out more, do it slowly, piecemeal, and then bring everything together and see how it functions as a whole uh, as a theoretical, systematic theory. Some people th suggest that Jung was not systematic. Uh, I think time has shown that he was, but we have to really dig into his work to do it. Uh, if you want to go into his 20-volume collected works and dig out the theory you can, what I want to do is make it a little easier and also point the way to some other thinkers, some other Jungians who have already done a lot of the legwork to tease out these ideas and make them easier to understand without getting into all of Jung's digressions. Jung is a wonderful author, wonderful to read. I highly recommend that you read Jung through this course, and, and even if you don't take the course, just he's just a wonderful author. But in some of his works, he'll start into a digression, an associative line of thought, which is purposeful. It's not just random, but it can throw people off, and I'm going to try and keep things focused on what we're doing. So hopefully by understanding some of the overriding theory, we will then better be able to understand how the basic Jungian concepts that we'll be studying can be helpful in doing inner work for ourselves and understanding how we can work with others, if we're a professional or just a counselor of any kind, and also how the culture can be transformed when people begin to understand just what is going on internally in the psyche. And what's really at stake, ultimately, is cultural generativity. Each of us, each mature human being, must learn how to transform narcissism into healthy self-esteem. And with a he healthy sense of self-esteem, we must learn how to then provide generative care for our families, for our communities, for our culture, and for the planet. And Jungian theory provides us with a way to steward these kinds of energies when we have a strong enough, uh, he calls it the individuation process, the first stage is to develop a strong sense of self so we can contain these energies, and the second phase is to turn within and be able to generate, steward, generative energies through the work that we do to help others. It keeps us going even when we're tired, even when we're not really feeling, oh, I can't do it now. Because we're tied into those energies, we rally the energy and serve our families and our culture in ways that we wouldn't be able to do otherwise. As I say, Jung's term is individuation. Individuation is the word that he used to describe the differentiation of the conscious ego from the unconscious self. That's the first phase, is to differentiate the two. As Jung says, the aim of individuation is nothing less than to divest the self of the self meaning the personality self here, the self of the false wrappings of the persona on the one hand, and of the suggestive power of primordial images on the other. And what he's saying is, we'll get into the, those terms, persona and primordial images as we move through this class. By primordial images, he means the archetypes, and by the persona, he means the face that we put out to the public. Now, we'll see here a, this is what I would call a metaphorical representation. If you cut open the human mind, you will not see an ego in a self. You will not, if someone does a, a dissection of a brain, they will not see a persona or consciousness or any of that. This is how we sort of abstract these subjective experiences. Now you see on the outside of the circle, we have the persona. That is the face that we develop in order to face the world outside. That of necessity, it's not represented here, but that of necessity, as I pick and choose what I want to show people out in the world, nat naturally I'm, I'm withholding other things. And what falls into what Jung called the shadow 
is those things that I've withheld and I don't want people in society to see. The center of consciousness, as you see here, is the ego. It's the sort of the processing center. The unconscious, where the there's many layers of the unconscious, and we'll talk about that in the first module. But the uh, the first basic layer of the personal unconscious is where complexes are, where the uh, things that fall out of, if I, I know where my keys are, they're, I can't find them, then I remember, oh, they're so-and-so. Well, they dipped into the unconscious. It's not deep unconscious, but that's something that's dipped into the con unconscious, but I can pull it out. There are other things that are not so easily uh, rescued or retrieved from the unconscious. Then uh, there's a representation here of the self, the archetype of the self. The archetypes will dwell in this area below called the collective unconscious and the communication between the ego through the personal unconscious to the archetype of the self looks very direct here in this diagram as we'll see. It can be a very, very difficult, painstaking uh, Jung at times referred to it, uh, compared it to crucifixion. He said the crucifixion actually was a, a lovely uh, metaphoric representation of the individuation process. So the individuation process is not a pretty, easy, uh, candy canes and unicorns kind of experience. It's a very, 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 very painful and difficult one, but well worthwhile when we can uh, withstand it. Now, a key idea, in, and this is an idea that I'm sure many of you are familiar with, but a key idea in depth psychology in general, it really began with Freud, it's not uh, unique to Jung, but a very important idea is the idea of projection. Now, in this diagram, we see, uh, a, again, a metaphoric representation of, uh, these, by the way, are from uh, Esther Harding's book, The I and the Not I, which I highly recommend. It's a wonderful book for uh, understanding these structures that we're discussing. The textbook we're going to use in this course is Murray Stein's Jung's Map of the Soul. But uh, even in uh, conjunction with that book, uh, Harding's book, The I and the Not I, is really uh, wonderful adjunct. So the idea of projection is that when anyone, it, it develops the idea or rather the process, it develops very, very early, spontaneously. But what happens is when we have, we see, we encounter something in the world and we see it out there, and, but we don't, it, it's unknown. There's something in the world that's unknown, unfamiliar. And when something unknown or unfamiliar approaches us, our very evolution teaches us that uh, it's actually practical and useful to have a little anxiety because you don't know. It could be a predator. It could be any kind of a dangerous thing. So there's some anxiety. And in a, a state of anxiety, the, in this case, we're looking at a child's diagram. So the, the child reaches into the unconscious and tries to find something that is similar to this thing, some, some way to differentiate, to identify this thing. So the child thinks of this thing and then associates it with what is seen in the outside world. Well, when I, instead of seeing what's in the outside world, am actually seeing part of myself, that is what Freud originally called projection, and Jung uh, used that term as well. I've projected an unconscious content onto a person, a thing, or a situation in the outer world, and... I experience that thing in the outer world partly as what's actually out there and partly as a part of myself, that I'm not conscious of it, but I'm really in conversation with myself, not with the thing in the outer world. Now, to better illustrate this concept, Jung, in a book that was uh, key in his big sort of break with and separation from Freud, uh, he came up with a book called it was originally called the um, psychology of the unconscious. Later, he sort of updated it, and it became symbols of transformation. But in this book, he points to the myth of the hero as a way to illustrate the tendency of the ego to descend into the unconscious in order to access the libido or the psychic energy that is available through the archetypes. And as I say, this was described by Neumann as being... Um, 
a process that's of a process of fragmentation that occurs again through uh, projection onto something outside ourselves, usually another person. Uh, one way that another quote, this is a quote from Eric Neumann, which he says, in the process of realizing and assimilating an unconscious content, the ego makes a descent from the conscious standpoint into the depths in order to raise up the treasure. This is from his classic book, The Origins, Neumann's classic book, The Origins and History of Consciousness. And in both Jung's Symbols of Transformation and in Neumann's The Origins and History of Consciousness, Jung and Neumann both talk about the role of the hero and the symbolic nature of the hero's, what Joseph Campbell later came to call the hero's journey. And what we see here is a depiction of, drawn very much from Joseph Campbell's work, who, uh, of course, was very influenced by Jung. And the, the cycle is represented here, again, metaphorically and symbolically through this little cycle around this circle. So there's a departure. We're in the ordinary world. Then there's a call to adventure or perhaps a refusal of the call. Some event happens. Something interrupts the normal process of life. And there's what is sometimes referred to as, Norman just referred to as a descent or a departure. Perhaps the hero meets a mentor, but however, he or she crosses the threshold. There are tests, there are allies, there are enemies. Sometimes little animals come and help the hero as they do in fairy tales. Eventually there's this descent deep, deep, deep down into the underworld or someplace, an innermost cave, someplace where there's great suffering. There's some sort of ordeal. Then there's death and rebirth. There's a reward. The energy of the reward, the treasure is seized. There's a road back to the ordinary world. There's a sort of resurrection. And this treasure, this boon, in this case it's called the elixir, is brought back to the world to serve the community. And the circle continues. So, um, one way to understand this in terms of, as we were talking about earlier, this process of differentiation from what, it, uh, again, as Esther Harding calls it, the I and the not I. This is a diagram, a series of diagrams in Edward Edinger's book, Ego and Archetype, another book that's highly recommended. See, this original state, uh, sometimes mythologically called the Euroboric state, but we can talk about that later, but the the idea of identification of the ego and the self are completely in case. This is what Jung called participation or par participation mystique and or participation mystique in which everything that I see, I think I'm seeing the outer world, but really I'm just seeing my own unconscious projected onto the outer world because I'm totally identified with the unconscious. This is this diagram where the ego is completely encased. Now, when I go through the hero's journey, cycle through that, a little bit of differentiation happens. I've got a little bit of maturity, a little bit of separation, a little bit of consciousness, and I'm not projecting quite so much. I'm not so uh, possessed by the archetype, so possessed, so um, in an inflated state, as Jung would say, and we're going to get into that more in a minute. But little bit by little bit, then I go through the hero's journey again. I cycle through it many, many times, and I'm more and more, as we see in figure three, differentiated. And if I can do this, or if anyone can do this, and with this line, you see this line, uh, Neumann originally came up with the term ego self-axis, and Edward Edinger uses it again uh, in his book, Ego and Archetype. But if we can maintain this contact, this connection, this dialogue with the deep unconscious, with the archetypal self, where this new, uh, numinous and highly charged energy is available to us, if we keep that contact with the archetype of the self through many, many descents and rising up again, uh, going through this cycle of the hero's journey over and over again, then we begin to get a place. Now, if, if that line isn't there, if it's just the ego on top and the self on the bottom, this would be called a state of dissociation, a state of alienation where there's no connection. This is really the state of modern man or modern people is where there's very little line, if any at all, connecting to the self. There's no uh, religious 
sense. There's no sense of, of reality. There's there's no gods. I everything is centered around this. This is the the geocentric state in Copernican terms, where everything revolves around the ego. But when that happens, there's great, great, great instability. One is going to either be inflated by an archetype, thinking that I am everything, or completely alienated from the archetype. And I'm going to go into that more in just a minute. But that's why when we can maintain this ego self-axis, where there's a communication with the deep unconscious, not just a communication like sending notes back and forth, but where there's a real sense of stewarding this archetypal energy, where I know it's not my energy, it's collective energy, it's human energy that is a gift to me, which I share, which I steward with others. Now this is the same, this is a diagram of the exact same hero's journey, but this is in strictly Jungian terms. This is again a diagram from... uh, Edward Edinger's book, Ego and Archetype. So he, this state uh, of the hero, when he just starts out, he's calling original wholeness or a state of inflation or a, just a little before that, he calls that passive inflation. Over on the left there, you'll see passive inflation. So it's just, it's a sense where the energy is there. I'm feeling okay. Everything is working. But if I think, if, I'm, if I don't have that ego self-axis, if I'm not in touch with the fact that it's not my energy, it's an energy that's gifted to me by virtue of being a participant in life, in reality. If I'm not aware of that, if I think it's all me, then I move into active inflation. This is a Jungian term, which means I'm identified with the archetype. I think I am the archetypal energy. And in that state of active inflation, I do something which is an inflated or or heroic act. In other words, it's a little bit more than I can handle. I think that I can do anything and then I stub my toe, or I walk into a wall, or I, uh, I'm so dissociated from reality that I insult my wife and I end up getting divorced, or I uh, make a mistake at work. I think I'm so great I can do something and I lose the company a lot of money. Whatever it is, maybe I, I'm my, I succumb to my alcoholism. Whatever, uh, I'm inflated and I fall down below this threshold. I'm rejected by those who once respected me. I'm alienated from myself. I have no access to this psychological energy. I have no access to the archetypal energy. I'm alienated. I'm wounded. I'm dismembered. I feel this great sense of humility. I start to repent. I just feel... I I develop what Edinger is calling here a sacrificial attitude, which you notice that sacrifice is key in all primitive uh, religious practices. And I, I, I have this sense that I really must sacrifice what this sense of inflation, this sense that I am the greatest. I, ha- I have to give that up. I know it's not true because here I am down in the, in the ashes, so to say. As I get more in touch with reality through the ashes, through this repentant state, I then see that I have access to the energy, but it's not my energy. It's energy that I have access to that I can bring up and help others with. And so in that greater sense of the reality principle, being more in touch with what is true, what is right, acknowledging what is in the world. I begin to reconnect with who I am, with what's possible. And again, I raise up into the circle, into the state of passive inflation. Now I'm, I'm, now I'm a little bit more capable. I'm a little bit more aware of who I am. I have a little bit more self-efficacy and agency in the world. Now this brings us back again to the other diagram of Edinger, where by doing that, I'm a little bit more uh, differentiated. I'm a little less in a state of participation mystique, participation mystique, where I'm identified with the unconscious, and I become a little more conscious, and I develop a little bit more of the ego self-axis. The more I go through that process over and over, I learn through that, I learn the skills, and I learn and I recognize that I am not, I am not the energy. I am not the God. I, if I behave myself and I am humble enough, I will have access to this energy and I will be gifted uh, through skills that I develop, through hard work. I will be gifted to help others and to steward this vital, numinous, psychic, uh, that is to say, psychological energy with others and to others in the world. Now, as I said earlier, this uh, process of going back and forth involves uh, 
the repetition of this process involves uh, the fragmentation of the archetypes and of the complexes. Now we haven't talked about complexes. There will be a whole module on complexes later in the the uh, course, but for now I'm just going to kind of gloss over it because it's it, it's not a difficult concept, but it's, it takes us off on a little tangent, so I'm going to avoid that for now. So although this identification with the archetypal content leads to an inflated state, the fragmentation allows for a slow process of integration and assimilation of the fragmented contents of the archetype. Every time I break down, I have the the energy, the treasure, the numinous uh, psychological energy that I've been previously alienated from becomes available to me. This process of fragmentation and assimilation involves a process of making unconscious projections conscious. In this light, we can see the hero's journey involves a progressive cycle of journeying, <coughs> excuse me, and projecting and making conscious various structures of the unconscious. Now, Jung has identified these structures as the personal shadow, the anima slash animus, depending on our gender identification, and eventually the deep archetypes of the collective unconscious, which uh, relate to what we in this culture and most cultures have understood to be uh, religious symbols. So, again, that's that's a, a lot. It involves, as I said, this process of projection and recollection, projecting and then fragmenting and making accessible a more realistic, a more grounded sense of both who and what is outside of myself and who and what or exactly what uh, this energy is and these structures are in my own being, in my own unconscious. So this first one we mentioned on that list is the shadow. Now why would Jung use a sort of anthropomorphic, a sort of human-like figure and call it the shadow? Uh, that doesn't sound, again, if you cut open, do a, a dissection, of a human brain, you will not find a human shadow. But the way, how did Jung uh, come to know about these things? How did he come to know about the structures of the unconscious? He did it largely through two methods. You could say three, but all right, we'll say two or three methods. But one is through cultural forms, mythologies, uh, I'll just leave it at mythologies because there's many different subcategories of that fairy tales and religious forms and alchemy and etc etc so they're mythologies cultural artifacts I'll call them and the other is through dreams now I said two or three because with Jung his dream work involved ultimately active imagination so that would be a third category I, I consider it really they're pretty much uh they're part of the same work. But the study of dreams, in the study of dreams, Jung would see a dark figure come up. If it was a woman, they should typically see a dark feminine figure who is very mean or very triggered, all kinds of negative things. And that would represent a woman's shadow. In a man, he would see a dark male figure. And the gender being specific is for specific reasons. Uh, as we get into the anima anima, so I'll talk about gender because in our culture today, gender takes on multiple forms. They're not the strict kind of gender roles that Jung was familiar with in 19th century Switzerland, 19th century Europe. So the idea is that all when, when I begin to adapt to the cultural milieu around me, I see, first it's my family, I see that my family like it, if I act like a little boy, they like it if I play with trucks, they like it if I show an interest in learning how to be a doctor or a lawyer. So I begin to, all of those things that, uh, that line up with, align with the values of my parents and with the culture around me, I tend to put those forward. Anything else, if I, if I like something, you know, I like to smoke cigarettes or I like to take drugs or I, I keep those things in the background. I don't want them to know that because they don't reward me for that. They punish me for that. So that goes into the shadow. Same thing with you can list any number of different compulsions or different just 
even just experiment. Then sometimes they're not really bad things at all. They're just children like to experiment and they try things, but then they're embarrassed. Shame comes up. So anything shameful, dark, goes into the shadow. Why? Because it doesn't conform with this other structure that we've constructed, which is the persona. So what's the next structure we mentioned was the anima and the animus. Now, as I said, culturally today, we do not have broadly the same gender roles that uh, were very, very rigid in 19th century uh, Europe and Switzerland where Jung grew up. Uh, for him, it was very clear, and for his patients, see, he, he, all these things came either from his own psyche or from the psyche of his patients, working with patients. And with them, they had pretty strict gender roles, so a woman would very clearly have a male animus, a man would have very clearly a feminine animus. It means a figure in the dreams that would come up that would be very seductive and very, for, for an animus, it tends to be very opinionated, according to Jung, and for an animus, it would be very, uh, manip- anima, sorry, for a man's feminine figure, would be very manipulative and very seductive. So these figures today in contemporary culture, it's, it, some people would want to just reject the concept of anima animus altogether because gender roles are so more fluid in our culture. However, uh, I don't think we should reject them. I think what we need to be aware of is that whatever our conscious gender identity is, the anima animus, if it's a mixed identity, then I'm also going to have a mixed identity, uh, anima or animus. If it's more one gender identity identification, than another, then the opposite is going to be in the unconscious. So the idea is that there's an opposite gender figure in the unconscious. Whatever my identification is, the opposite is going to be in the unconscious. And we're going to do a whole uh, module on Anima Anonymous, so there'll be a lot more to say about that. Knowing something about this is one of the most difficult things for people to wrestle with, this idea of the Anima Anonymous and being able to uh, certainly fragment and assimilate the energies of the anima animus very 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 difficult most people jung says spend most of their life working on the shadow and barely even get to touch the anima animus but uh, it is possible it's an important concept to understand and as i say we'll get into it more and more as we uh, progress through this course i'm going to leave it at that but another important point about the anima animus is that it is actually a sort of gateway to the collective unconscious because it's partly made up of personal unconscious factors the mother my anima would be made up of my mother my sister my grandmother people women that i knew when i was young and this archetypal factor so it's right on the borderline between the personal unconscious and the collective unconscious and these terms personal and collective unconscious we'll get into more in the course as well of course for now what i want to do is say a little bit about uh, the life of of C.G. Jung, just give a little overview of him, of his work, and what he did. And after that, I'll give a brief uh, summary of the eight modules that we'll be going through in the eight-week course, Jung 101. So, what kind of person was C.G. Jung himself? Well, he was born in 1875 in Kesswil, Switzerland. Now, 1875 is the 19th century, and 1876 is the year of the Battle of the Little Bighorn, the famous Custer's Last Stand. So we're really talking about 19th century. And yet, Jung's work, here we are, 21st century, and still people have not really grasped or uh, been able to accept, certainly not the intellectual world, uh, has not really grasped and accepted uh, Jung's work, by and large, or the Copernican nature of the revolution that he's uh, brought about, proposed, is in the certainly, I'd say, in the process of bringing about. He was certainly well, well aware of the necessary changes in culture well before uh, any of his peers and, and even people today. So the milieu in which he grew up was not just 19th century, but uh, 19th century Christian, specifically Lutheran. His father was a pastor and uh, a pastor who had lost his faith. And many say that um, Jung's uh, work in many ways was a response to this struggle that he saw uh, in, with some despair, saw his father going through. Uh, but his father seemed to be, Jung felt in denial about it. 
Jung wanted to face this same struggle. Well, what was the struggle? The struggle is this 19th and 20th century clash, many would say, between science and religion. His father seemed to think that science had disproven all these things that he believed in, and yet uh, he wanted to have faith, but he, he tried to just ignore it and deny it and kind of dance around it. Jung didn't want any of that. He wanted to face it head on, and, and although he perhaps didn't solve the problem, he certainly was not in denial about it and tried to reconcile these two um, worlds, which uh, had a lot to do with his choices as he went through school. And he did go through school. He graduated uh, in 1900 at the age of 25 with a medical degree from the University of Basel. And against the advice of his professors, Jung decided to go into psychiatry. Now, this was, this horrified his professors because he, uh, in those days, psychiatric hospitals, you, you've heard the term bedlam. Well, bedlam was the name of a psychiatric hospital because it was such a chaotic place. They really, psychiatric theory was just hellish and, and really didn't seem to be making any traction or making any sense. And oftentimes, from perhaps being in that environment, the psychiatrists themselves would seem rather unbalanced. Well, he was a promising, intelligent, brilliant young man, and his professors thought, my God, don't go into that. But Jung found that this that psychiatry for him was the perfect place for the subjective experience of the spirit to study that experience and the objective work of science. He felt that if there's something real there, then it can be studied scientifically. And he was determined to try to do that. And he felt psychiatry was a mode in which he could pursue that worthy goal. So he ended up uh, working at the Bergholzi Psychiatric Hospital, doing an internship there in Zurich under Professor Eugene Bloiler. He worked there from 1900 to 1909, during which time he earned his PhD in psychology at the University of Zurich, and he began work on the word association experiment, which led to his theory of complexes, which we'll discuss in detail in Module 2. Uh, the word association experiment was absolutely experimental psychology. A lot of people think, well, Jung didn't know much about science. This was, it, it made huge waves in the psychiatric world, and it, it actually was his, sort of the the means by which he began his re association with Freud, because Freud was so impressed that he'd come up with a scientific method for identifying processes in the unconscious, using this word association test, which by the way, eventually became uh, the basis for uh, the lie detector test. So it was also during this time that Jung read Sigmund Freud's classic book, The Interpretation of Dreams. And he initiated, because of reading that book, he initiated a correspondence with Freud, and Jung and Freud first met in 1907 in Vienna. Now, a lot of people like to say, oh, uh, Jung, uh, I should say Freudians like to say that Jung was Freud's student. It, it, that was never the case. They were always colleagues. Freud was very, very interested in this experimental work of Jung's, and uh, it, it's just not the case that he was, matter of fact, he, he was, certainly Freud was the older man, uh, and um, one reason Jung himself said that he did not disagree more strongly with Freud earlier in their relationship was because he was so much older than him and he wanted to show him, as uh, certainly people of that time naturally would do, the elder person would just be shown a certain amount of respect just because of their age. Well, because of this association and his great success in the psychoanalytic world, which was a very controversial world as it is, uh, because of that, he resigned from the Burgle C. Psychiatric Hospital and opened up his own private psychoanalysis practice in Kusnacht, which he ran until his death in 1961. Now, from 1907 until 1913, Jung's work was closely associated with the work of Freud. They were colleagues and collaborators, but, as I'd mentioned earlier, when Jung first published his classic work, Symbols of Transformation, it was originally titled... Uh, the Psychology of the Unconscious, but uh, in 1952 he rewrote it to be called Symbols of Transformation. In any case, when he wrote that, because he finally did speak his mind, say what he thought about um, how uh, 
the development of psychiatric theory needed to go, and it was very different from Freud's ideas. Uh, this marked a huge uh, departure from Freud's theory, and it was also in this book that Jung made his first suggestions of the idea of a collective unconscious. Well, Freud took this as being a basically a, a, a deliberate attack on him, and even though Jung was president of the International Psychoanalytic Association, and he was sort of understood to be Freud's successor and his crown prince, they called him. Uh, he eventually had to resign from the International Psychoanalytic Association, and he made his final break with Freud in 1913. And because of this, now remember, he was very, very, uh, it was controversial just to be a psychiatrist. Then it was even more controversial to be a psychoanalyst, and then he gets thrown out or essentially uh, becomes a pariah in the psychoanalytic movement because of his ideas differing from Freud's. So now he's just completely alienated from everybody. This is when we saw that hero's journey. He was down at the bottom at this point because he'd made the heroic move of, of differing from his, uh, what some would call his mentor, but certainly his friend, uh, Sigmund Freud. And uh, this was very, very difficult. He's 38 years old. And this began what uh, Jung has called his confrontation with the unconscious. You've all heard of the famous Red Book. It was during this time that he eventually began work on that. He had staked everything on his relationship with Freud, who was very controversial, and now he was considered an outcast from the controversial psychoanalytic movement in which he had previously been a rising star. But during this lengthy period, from 1913 to 1921, Although Jung published very little, he was largely occupied with his practice and with his own inner work. And through that inner work, uh, this work resulted in the creation of this astonishing Red Book, which in turn laid the groundwork for Jung's revolutionary theory. Now, the Red Book is a whole separate uh, topic, which we will discuss in later courses. But for now, we can say that it it had a lot to do with a technique that I mentioned earlier, which was called active imagination. And I'll leave that at that for now. Suffice to say, it helped Jung through this period and gave him the energy. You know, I was talking about accessing this energy that we steward for others. Well, this came out of Jung like gangbusters. He just wrote and wrote and wrote. He finally first published in 1921 his book, Psychological Types which was his most important contribution to ego psychology, which, again, we'll talk about more in Module 1. Uh, but he also began to outline some of his understanding of the structures of the unconscious and some of the basics of his general theory. So in 1921, with the publication of this book, he was 46 years old, and he spent the next nearly 40 years of his life fleshing out the details of this newly formed theory. Uh, he found support for many of these ideas, again, very controversially in ancient mythology and especially in the writings of the ancient alchemists. Jung continued to generate an enormous number of publications and produced some of his most challenging and complicated works in his 70s. So he, he certainly had access to this energy that I've been talking about. In 1950, Jung published his book Ion, when he was 75 years old. This is a massive treatise on the archetype of the self. In 1951, his lecture on synchronicity was published along with uh, work by Wolfgang Pauli. They worked together on this theory. Pauli was a Nobel Prize winning physicist. In 1952, Jung published his book Answer to Job. He was 77 years old. And in 1955, he published his magnum opus, Mysterium Conjunctionis, when he was 80 years old. And there's a lot to say about each of these works. We'll talk about more of them in future courses. But uh, in 1961, he died after a short illness at his home in Kusnacht near Zurich. He was 85 years old. He left a massive body of work that is largely unsystematic and is quite difficult for the uninitiated to wade through. So the task in this series of courses, particularly this one, to kind of set the groundwork, will be to outline some of Jung's basic ideas and his mapping of the inner structures of the psyche. And that's just the basics. Then 
Why is that useful? Well, there are practical applications, there are practical methods, and this whole series of courses, which will include courses on practical applications of Jungian psychology, on active imagination, and on dream work, and on mythology, and fairy tales, and alchemy, and a capstone course will be a uh, historical overview of depth psychology in general, and Jung's place in it. So, Jung began working on his theory in the early 20th century and continued until he passed away in June of 1961. Since that time, there have been many theorists who have built on Jung's theory and or changed and adapted it in a number of ways. This course and the other courses in this series will introduce you to Jung's ideas mainly through his own words and through the words of students and close associates who stuck relatively closely to Jung's ideas. This approach is generally referred to as a classical Jungian psychology approach. Once you understand Jung's approach, you will be better equipped to evaluate other approaches to Jung's work and other approaches to depth psychology in general. Whether you are taking this course in order to earn the certificate or simply to audit, you will benefit very much from reading the textbook Jung's Map of the Soul by Murray Stein. Throughout the course, we will refer to and draw on that text, which is thoroughly in conversation with Jung's own writings and will help to orient us in relation to Jung's vast collected works. So down to close, let's just briefly go through the eight modules of the Jung 101 course. Module one will be on the ego and the unconscious, the ego as the center of consciousness and its relationship to the unconscious. Foundational concepts, we'll look at what Jung has to say about this and we'll go into uh, some detail about it. Module two, we talk about the complexes. The complexes are related to Jung's work in the word association experiment and how he tracked that and it really became a, in, an important concept for all of depth psychology during that period and its central concept for Jungian psychology and it will really, I think, move us into a, a realm that I think you'll find really fascinating and very, very helpful in, in all the work we do with this uh, Jungian theory. Module three is the animating principle behind all this. Jung called it psychic energy for Freud. It was libido and libido was simply sexual, but for Jung, Psychic energy uh, came not just from sexuality, but also from hunger, from the biological need for homeostasis, and for the drive toward wholeness, which he described as a religious function of the psyche. We'll go into a lot of detail about that and the physics of psychic energy, how it moves energy around our consciousness. Module four, the real mediators of psychic energy are the archetypes of the collective unconscious. The collective unconscious is Jung's really groundbreaking concept, and we're going to tease that apart in some detail, Module 4, Archetypes and the Collective Unconscious. Then Module 5 and 6, we'll go into some of the actual structures of the deep unconscious, the persona and the shadow for Module 5, the anima, animus for Module 6. As I say, these are mediators of a great deal of psychic energy and there's a lot, there's so much practical value just understanding the persona and the shadow and just understanding anima and animus. If that's all that we learned in this course, we would uh, really have a leg up on many, many people because there's so many insights available through these concepts. However, we still have two more modules. We go into great detail on the, the big strike structure, the big mediator of energy, which Jung called the archetype of the self the central organizing principle of the psyche. Remember, it's central to Jung's Copernican revolution is that it's not the ego that's the center of the personality, it's the archetype of the self, which is in the deep unconscious. And there's a lot of nuance to that, which we will describe in some depth. And then finally, in module eight, we bring everything together with the, you know, we've teased everything apart, and now we bring it together in the process of individuation, which is the process of becoming an individual in a way that maintains this ego self axis so that we're constantly in touch with the deep unconscious and it informs our conscious deliberations and decisions. So module eight, we'll cover and kind of wrap things up with the individuation process and the ego self axis. Well, with that, that's a brief summary of the upcoming eight modules.
And with that, I'm going to close this introductory class. If you've enjoyed this class and would like to learn more, I hope you will consider signing up for the full Jung 101 course. Thanks for spending this time with me.